Um, so this time uh, we'll be talking about language model pre-training and language model pre-training is a very important topic for NLP nowadays. It's the way we build most of our state, uh, state of the art systems. I'll be talking about some of the basics and then Lucio, who's an expert on this topic, will be uh, talking about uh, some uh, recent topics, including some of his work. Uh, so I hope we can have a good discussion then. So um, before we talk about language model pre-training, we should be talking about multitask learning in general. And um, multitask learning, I'm going to be talking about this time and next time. So if we look at some terminology for multitask learning, um, multitask learning is a general term for uh, training on multiple tasks. And transfer learning in particular is a type of multitask learning. Uh, where we only really care about one of the tasks. So we might be training on multiple tasks, uh, but one or like a small subset of them are the ones we actually care about. The other ones are there solely for the purpose of uh, improving the accuracy on the ones we do care about. Um, Pre-training, again, is a subset of transfer learning um, where one of the objectives is used first and then we train on a different objective uh, later. So um, it implies that we're not just doing transfer learning, but we're doing it in a sequential order. And another uh, piece of terminology is few shot or zero shot learning. Um, and few shot or zero shot learning indicates learning to perform a task with very few or zero labeled examples uh, for that task. And in order to do well in few shot or zero shot learning, you traditionally need to like, you need to do multitask learning or transfer learning. There's no, um, there's no way that you can train the model only on uh, the small amount of data you have, or train it effectively. Uh, all set? Okay. Um, so there's a very, very large number of tasks in NLP. And like one of the things that I like about NLP is I think I mentioned uh, in one of the earlier classes is that it's so diverse. There's uh, you know a very broad scope that it covers. And um, each one requires a different variety of data to train on. Um, there are some tasks that only require text. Uh, and one example of this is language modeling. And uh, because this only requires text, but kind of by definition, you can get more data for this than you can for most other tasks. There's also tasks that require naturally occurring data. So this is data that we use you know, NLP researchers don't need to go out and uh, get, or um, we don't need to go out and create, let me put it that way. And machine translation is a very good example of this. Um, there's also many other cases where you can um, like go out and gather data that people are creating and turn it into a format that's useful for machine learning. So one example being like sentiment analysis you can go out and crawl a review site and get data uh, there for free, basically, without creating it yourself. Um, another uh, set of things is where you need hand-labeled data. And very often, that means you'll need to hire somebody to create it. And so uh, every time you create data, it will cost you money. So you need to worry, uh, worry about that. And this includes things like most analysis tasks, like part of speech tagging, or maybe kind of uh, esoteric uh, varieties of question answering or other things like that. So basically what you can see is uh, it, you're happier if you're higher on this bullet list because you need to worry less and pay less for data. You can get more of it. Um, Another thing to point out is that even if we can get data in one language or uh, domain, we might not be able to get data in another language or domain. Um, so for example, for English, uh, it might be very easy to get data for question answering over Wikipedia, but it might be much harder to get data for question answering over material science papers or something like this. So um, even in English, uh, you'll have trouble with domain. And then of course, you can buy that with being in another language or something like that, and it gets much harder. Okay, so um, standard multitask learning. Um, I'm calling this standard multitask learning because it's essentially uh, maybe the simplest in terms of the uh, things that you need to think about. Um, is basically training representations to do well on multiple tasks at once or training a model to do well on multiple tasks at once. So basically you have um, 
uh, an example and you take an encoder and you use the same encoder, but then you train it on multiple objectives like language modeling or tagging or other things like this. Um, when I say this is easier, it's easier to an extent. There are still things you need to think about, and I'm going to be talking about some of them, uh, some of them later. But basically, uh, often it's as simple as just randomly choosing a mini batch from one of the multiple tasks here. So you uh, you choose a mini batch from language modeling, then you choose a mini batch from tagging, you choose another mini batch from language modeling, you choose another mini batch from tagging, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in contrast, the pre-train and fine-tune paradigm, uh, basically the way it works is you first train on one task and then train on another. And um, to give an example here, uh, you would first train the encoder on language modeling and then, uh, then initialize the encoder for tagging. And the reason, uh, and uh, so basically this means that you have to have some uh, like language, lots of language modeling data, a little bit of tagging data, and uh, then you can initialize the tagging model with better representations than otherwise. How exactly you do the language modeling, what data you use, we're gonna talk about it more in a second, but this is a general paradigm. And uh, then finally, uh, there's the idea of prompting. And I think I just added this slide basically this year um, is it's kind of a new, a new way of doing multitask learning or transfer learning. But basically what you do um, is you train on the LM task and then make predictions on, uh, on textualized tasks. So you're essentially taking a encoder, uh, training it with a language modeling task, freezing it, not even doing any fine tuning, and um, then essentially turning whatever task you want to solve into a textual question, basically. Yeah. Yeah, oh, so that's a good question. Um, does this mean the two encoders have to have the same architecture? So um, for multitask learning, you can share as many or as few parameters as you like. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about this next class. But usually in the pre-trained and fine-tuned paradigm, you have your big like encoder that is encoding text. And then at the very end, you're making predictions uh, of like this is an example, end of sentence. And this is kind of like your, um, your language modeling prediction head or the softmax. Um, what you do when you're doing uh, pre-training and fine tuning is usually you just throw this away this part away, and then you have like a, a part of speech tagging uh, head, essentially. So this would be like um, a determiner, a verb, a determiner, or sorry, pronoun, a noun, verb, determiner, noun, or something like this. And so, you share most of the architecture, but then you replace like a very small part of it. But that's not absolutely necessary. You could share like as much or as little as you want. You could share just the first layer or something like that. This is just the most common way to do it. Um, any other questions? Okay. So um, these are kind of like the three ways that we um, we tend to do multitask learning or transfer learning in NLP nowadays. Um, I there's lots of nuance, and you can like combine these two to get these different ways together. You can uh, you know have complicated schedules of when you do pre-training and multitask learning, but for the time being, uh, these are the three major paradigms. Okay. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is talk about some general concepts in language model pre-training and then introduce uh, some individual pre-trained models to show how each of them instantiates each of these concepts. And uh, if we think about pre-trained language models, um, you, these almost have become like, I don't know, mystic in a way, you know, we give them names like uh, Bert or Roberta or GPT-3 or Palm or something like this. 
And uh, you hear uh, people say like open AI's so OpenAI's new AI, GPT-3, has formed consciousness or something like this. And um, so, like, in a way, if you look at it from the outside, uh, like, it may look like that. But as people who are, you know, NLP practitioners, we uh, it behooves us to, like, better understand what's uh, going on under the hood as well as we can. And so because of this, I think it's helpful to break down all of the design decisions that go into training each of these models. Um, and these, uh, these models, essentially what they do is they refer to a combination of several uh, design elements. The first one uh, being the model or the underlying network architecture. Um, the next one being the training objective, um, like what objective is used to pre-train the model. Another thing is the data uh, that they're trained on. And all of these things um, have a effect on the downstream performance of the model. And so uh, I think it's worth thinking about all of them. Um, so uh, another thing is that the papers presenting the models or uh, the papers presenting the models are often notable for the experimental results. So actually, I think a lot of people may focus less on the things up here, even though the things up here are important. Uh, a lot of the people focus on like what the model has been able to achieve. And because of that, I'm going to be uh, talking about that as well. So um, speaking of the design decisions that go in, um, just kind of on a high level before I dig into the details of each model, um, which model? Um, when we discuss about which model, usually it's a transformer-based model, like what we talked about last time. However, the details of each of the models vary. So the, the interesting thing is, like, despite the fact that everybody says they're using transformers, um, there, are small, there are small differences between the models here. And if you dig into the papers, you can see, uh, you can see them as well. Um, Another thing is uh, size is a very important parameter. Um, usually bigger models are more performant and we're gonna talk a little bit more about like scaling laws and other things like this at the end of the talk today uh, about how model performance affects, uh, you know, uh, model size affects performance in like training trajectories. Um, another thing is that model details uh, sometimes vary between them um, or uh, in the worst case, they're underspecified. Uh, so uh, certain certain people who like to train large language models actually like to not tell us the details that would be necessary to reproduce their work because um, their business model depends on it. So um, uh, unfortunately, sometimes these models are not super easy to reproduce either. Okay, um, so the next thing is the training objective. So uh, which training objective do we use? There's two most common varieties of training objectives that we use when we're training these models. Um, the first one is autoregressive language modeling. And um, like I mentioned before, this is when we're training a model that uh, predicts the next word left to right. These are more commonly used um, in the prompting or text generation uh, paradigms because uh, if because you know they can generate text, but um, the other variety is mass language modeling. Um, and mass language modeling is more frequently used in the pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm. So uh, the, the reason why mass language modeling is probably more commonly used for pre-training and fine-tuning is because it's a bi-directional model. So it's more uh, conducive to like, for example, making tag word-by-word uh, -word predictions. Finally, um, which data? So data is extremely important. Um, common sources of this include uh, something called the books corpus. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this is this was used in training BERT and a few of the follow-up models. Um, it's actually now a little bit out of date and it's not available publicly on the internet anymore, uh, probably because people realize that distributing lots of books is illegal. Um, and, <laughs> Uh, so instead of this, uh, most of the modern models use things like uh, Wikipedia or the Common Crawl. Um, Wikipedia, everybody knows already. Uh, it's also easy to download the text from it. Um, Common Crawl is data from the whole internet. And um, 
so it, you can uh, you can trade on basically a lot of different varieties of text. Cool. Are there any uh, questions so far? Okay, uh, pretty straightforward. So um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is representation learning through LMs and specifically representation learning uh, as is used most commonly in the pre-training versus fine-tuning paradigm or pre-training and fine-tuning paradigm. And uh, the most famous uh, variety of model uh, or the, the model that made this paradigm like most famous is BERT. Um, there were definitely some models before this, like context of X and, uh, and Elmo and other things like that, but I'm just going to start with BERT here. Um, so BERT, uh, the way it works is it's essentially a transformer model, um, and it uh, has multi-layer self-attention, uh, multi-layer transformers. The input to the model is uh, essentially sentence pairs. And uh, this is an important thing to know if you want to use it for something. Um, when I say sentence pairs, uh, this is a little bit small. It might be hard to see from the back, but hopefully hopefully you can see it. It's basically you have um, like my dog is cute. Um, he likes he likes playing. So uh, they also indicated that they're using a subword based model that does subword segmentation as well here. Um, in between the sentences, we have the separator token, uh, which indicates uh, the breaks between the sentences. And then we have the CLS token here. Uh, the CLS token is a token that's used in like text classification or other things like that. Um, and uh, I'll explain why this token is special in a second. So the input to the transformer model is basically token embeddings, um, where you have an embedding for each token, like I talked about before. We also have positional embeddings, like I talked about last class. So we have position zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, et cetera. And in addition, BERT also ad adds uh, segment embeddings. So this is indicating like segment A and segment B, uh, which allows it to process like pairs of sentences. Um, the training objective that we use to train the model is, uh, is twofold. Uh, the first one is masked word prediction. So um, basically predicting uh, words. And another one is next sentence prediction. And the data, it was trained on books, corpus, and uh, English Wikipedia. So the masked word prediction objective, this is kind of the, the major innovation that Bert uh, like proposed. And the way it works is you mask out a word in the input. So basically like um, you have my dog is cute. Dog is cute. And what you do is you mask out this word or you actually mask out um, uh, you mask out 15% of the words in the input or Bert masks out 15% of the words in the input. And uh, then you try to predict the word. And um, previously what people did was they did like left to right prediction or right to left prediction to predict uh, representations. Like for example, Elmo was a bi-directional language model that predicted from left to right and then right to left. Um, but this is a kind of a uh, nice, way of doing things and this really caught on and a lot of people use this afterwards so can anybody think of like what the advantage is um what the advantage is of doing this sort of like masking out and then prediction versus like predicting from left to right or right to left in both yeah computer parallel you don't need to go sequentially so it's faster yeah so that's um that's a very good answer it's almost the answer that i was looking for um transformers still can compute in parallel if you're doing left to right um but they have to do like masking um they have to do kind of the uh mask it, left to right masking in order to make that happen um i have an answer on the uh on zoom which is exactly the answer i was looking for which is you can consider bi-directional context uh directly when you're making the prediction instead of 
considering the left context separately and the right context separately. So because you're masking things out, you still are encoding like all of these things here. Um, you're including all of the all of the things on the left, all of the things on the right, and making the prediction here. So it's uh, kind of a, a nice way to get bidirectional context. Um, so the the way the word masking works in BERT is essentially um, you predict or you mask out um, you mask out fifteen percent of the the words in the input. Um, there's not something magical about 15, but pre presumably it was a well-tuned hyperparameter and follow-up like work also showed that that's a pretty good percentage. Um, when you mask out, it's not always adding a, a quote-unquote mask. It's 80% of the time adding a quote-unquote mask, 10% of the time substituting the input word with a random word, and 10% of the time doing no change. So this is, um, I, I think there's a lot of good things about like the BERT paper. One is that it's actually quite simple, the method that they're using. However, it's also well-founded. And this like 80, 10, 10 is, is a pretty well-founded uh, proportion as well. So the, the masking, basically what it's doing is it's saying, uh, you don't know the, the identity of the input. So please go ahead and, and predict the identity of the input. Um, but why would you also want to add 10% uh, substituting input words with random words and 10% no change? Any ideas? Yeah. So we don't have repeating sequences. Um, BERT isn't actually used very much for text generation. So repeating sequences might not be uh, the biggest problem there, but yeah. The way to do some sort of invariance or regularized change. Um, yeah, well, once you start saying it's it's a good way to regularize things, uh, it, that's kind of like a, a bit vague. So uh, maybe a little bit more specific. I guess the mask actually doesn't exist in the vocabulary. So I guess it's a way to give it something else so it doesn't kind of associate the mask with some particular thing. Yeah, um, and I, I got another similar thing on, on Zoom. So uh, what the comment was in, in the room was basically the mask doesn't exist in the vocabulary. So this is a way to... Um, Get it to associate uh, the uh, to avoid associating the mask with a particular thing. Another thing is there's no mask in the test set, um, so you want the model to be able to predict. So what you do at test time when you're using the representations, you don't actually use the mask. You are just usually inputting full sentences because, like, why would you want to throw away information when you're uh, at test time? And so uh, this basically allows the, the model to continue to function even in the case where we don't have masks in the input. Um, another, uh, in particular, having this no change here 10% of the time indicates that like 10% of the time when you're making a prediction, you still, it still would be beneficial to keep around information ab about the original word. And so like if you, if you didn't do this at all, um, the model might be incentivized to basically forget the original word, like never, never keep around information about the original word. So this incentivizes the model to still keep, uh, you know, some information around that would allow you to predict uh, what the word was originally, which is obviously very important if you're doing like part of speech tagging or something like that. Um, I had another question. Uh, does it act kind of like label smoothing? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe a little bit. You could view it as like kind of 90%, 90% label smoothing, whereas normally we do like 10% label smoothing or 5% label smoothing. But yeah, it's basically um, uh, analogous, but not exactly the same. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a little bit confused. So uh, when we're doing uh, mask word prediction, in the 10, 10 case, are we doing prediction still? We don't have a mask, right? Yeah, you, you are. So um, in... In 10% of the time, it looks like this. You have like, my blue is cute and it predicts dog. That, that would be case number two. And then uh, another 10% of the time you have my dog is cute and it predicts dog. So um, basically what that's saying is 10% of the time just predicting yourself is a good strategy. And so because of that, all the way to the very end layers of the model, it still keeps the word identity around at least a little bit. Um, Cool. So um, 
The second thing that BERT uses is consecutive sentence prediction. And basically this is a classification task. It's a binary classification task where you, oh, um, sorry, I, I have a question. So I was wondering if you don't mask dog every time, it, the BERT model would keep outputting dog. So it is repeating the word dog, so, but if you mask it can output cat sometimes as well, right? Yeah, so um, if you- so it, Is this kind of along the lines of label smoothing or? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit like label smoothing as uh, the previous question asked, but like if we have mask, we have no information here, obviously. So um, it will try to predict things that kind of make sense in the context, uh, independent of the input. Um, if it, if you input dog, it will probably give dog about it will probably give dog about like a 10% probability or maybe like 12% probability or something like that. Uh, because, you know, if it's, if predicting yourself is correct about 10% of the time, then, you know, the model will learn to predict yourself about 10% of the time. And then uh, the, the rest of the probability will be like other things that seem to work well in this context, like cat, fish, uh, sun, you know, any, anything that would fit. Um, yeah, I have, uh, three questions. So one, two, and then one on two. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, how much context is needed to buy this in, like, this last bit of, you know, last time you could, like, in, if you just give it my dash, it would be, yeah. but no other, like, preceding sentence about a dog, something to like, my father. Yeah, so this is a very good question. How much um, how much context is provided? Um, actually, maybe I'll just talk about the next uh, the next thing here. But um, uh, Bert also includes an objective of um, consecutive sentence prediction, and consecutive sentence prediction basically you have two sentences, and then you have a binary uh, prediction task where you try to predict not next or next uh, is next, um, and is next is basically like these two sentences are consecutive. Like the man went to mask store, he bought a gallon mask milk. Um, and in this case, these are like actually consecutive in discourse. And then you predict uh, is next and the man masked at the store and penguin mask are flightless birds. Um, and these are not consecutive sentences. So it would predict not next. And an important thing here is when making the prediction, they use the CLS token um to try to make the prediction and because of this basically what that's saying is um i'm going to try to get kind of more global information about the two sentences and the relationship between them in this cls token uh, so i can solve this uh, problem and because of that uh you know traditionally when people use bert for classification problems they also use the cls token because it's kind of been like trained to uh trained to do it in this way. So like, um, there's a couple ways to use BERT for classification. You can either use the CLS token or you can like average all of the embeddings or stuff like that. But the reason why people use the CLS token is because of the way BERT was trained. Um, so then going back to your original question, how much context is used? In the training of BERT specifically, uh, two sentences. That's as many as they, they trained on there. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a really good question. Um, just to repeat the question, it was like, what if um, we have subword segmentation, like to, to go back to the example here, we have play and ing. Um, and let's say uh, the subword token for ing was masked out. If that's the case, it seems like it, it might be like very easy, I guess, uh, maybe to interpret your words more than you said them. Maybe, maybe it would be like too easy to predict the word ing here or something like that. Um, so that uh, might be the case. It's even more the case if we're talking about something like um, San Francisco or something like that, and uh, it masks out 
like Cisco, but not Fran or something that that seems like it would be like very simple and uh, like kind of uninteresting. Um, so the original BERT doesn't do anything about that. Basically, they just mask subwords. Um, there's also another version of BERT using whole word masking, um, where basically they remember the boundaries of the words and they mask out the whole word at a time as opposed to um, subwords. And that is in general better than BERT because for the reason that you kind of assumed it's like too easy to predict individual subwords. And then there's also other, um, there's another method called span BERT, which masks out spans, uh, like lo longer spans at a time. And that's further better, especially for tasks that require like prediction of spans, like named entity recognition or other stuff like that. So, yeah, um, I had a question on Zoom. Um, so why does the random word masking help? Um, this one's maybe a little bit less, clear to me um, why it would help specifically for um, why it would help specifically for like representation learning. Um, I guess the reason why is because it, it kind of, in a way, allows the model to identify like grammatical errors with the sentence. Um, and that seems like a harder task than predicting the correct thing when you're masking. Um, there's another model I'm going to talk about in a second called Electra that also uses a similar uh, training approach that seems to work pretty well. Um, but I, I'm guessing it just is like kind of a harder task than masked uh, mask language uh, prediction here. Um, it, you could also view it as like a contrastive task where like 10% of the time it's a random word, 10% of the time it's like no change. So you need to force it. Um, you need to force it to decide whether this is a like ungrammatical or unnatural word for the context or it's the correct word for the context. Um, cool, yeah, I had a question. Yeah. Um, since it's not, mostly of that because they not at the same time. What happens if like the word that is masked kind of takes away from the next sentence to the key, like you mask a really important word. Yeah, so what, what happens, um, the question was what happens if the masking uh, takes away from the next sentence prediction? What if it's a really important word? Um, then maybe it doesn't do very well at the next sentence prediction. Um, like one, one interesting thing is that um, having really hard training objectives for pre-training or multitask learning doesn't seem to be like a huge problem. Uh, it, it might add a little bit of noise into the training process. It might overfit to like spurious things, like when it doesn't have, like when a model doesn't have the information that it needs to solve the task that it's supposed to solve, it might fit onto like other spurious things. But um, as far as I can tell, like you can add lots of noise uh, to the input and it seems like uh, it doesn't hurt that much for these kinds of things. Um, I had another question. Um, can the random word masking help uh, with downstream tasks such as alternate word and phrase suggestions like Grammarly does? Um, yes, it, it totally could do that. Um, uh, so like, for example, it, it could be used for grammatical error correction like Grammarly. The only problem is that it would only be able to do it uh, word to word replacements uh, easily and you'd have to do something else uh, to do um, like non word to word replacements. There's other sequence to sequence pre-training things that we're not gonna be talking about this class, but a later class that are probably more suited to doing something like that. Um, okay, so next, um, I, I'd like to move on to a new, another model. So another model is, um, is basically like, um, is called Roberta. And Roberta was like a follow-up model. Uh, the background behind it was that uh, Google came out with BERT, and then um, because uh, Google and Facebook at the time needed to do the same thing the other person was doing, but slightly differently. Um, <laughs> uh, this is this is Facebook's version of uh, of BERT essentially, um, and so they they tried to re reproduce BERT, and um, it it ended up being uh, harder than uh, harder than they thought to reproduce BERT, but eventually they they figured it out. And Roberta is very, very similar to BERT. Um, the model is, is virtually the same. Um, the objective is the same as the BERT uh, masked language uh, modeling objective, but um, it was trained longer. So they just kept on training for longer. 
And they also dropped the next sentence prediction objective uh, because I guess they didn't find it to be particularly useful, um, which actually casts a little bit of doubt on like the importance of the next the CLS token and other things like this. But uh, take it as you will. Um, and uh, they trained on the same data. So basically, more or less, they just trained the model for longer. Um, <laughs> results are empirically mu much better. So I think basically the bird, what this says is the bird authors um, stopped training when they had beaten the state of the art on everything and then decided it, it probably like wasn't worth their GPUs or TPUs to continue training. So um, yeah, but uh, because of this, like Roberta, you know, is probably a better like baseline to be using than BERT. Like, um, you know, I, I wouldn't, uh, although there actually are a few cases where BERT is better. Yeah, sorry. But it's a little unrelated, but yeah. a research question like, should we train longer? Is that really valid in research skills? I, I think any question that you might wonder about is valid in research, you know, um, <laughs> and like, so, you know, I, I kind of want to know the answer to that question, like, um, how, how long do we need to train, uh, train models for? There's actually a really good paper that we're not going to talk about this time, but maybe we can uh, when we get to your part, Chinchilla, yeah, um, and uh, so there, there's uh, a relatively interesting paper about this uh, recently that we'll talk about maybe at the end of class today. Yeah, and Lu Lucio can talk about it. Um, okay, so uh, this is Roberta. Um, another paper that's kind of interesting um, is uh, Electra, and you'll also hear uh, some people using the trained Electra model. Um, so the model uh, itself, the model architecture is the same as BERT, um, but they have a different approach objective. And um, the different objective is uh, basically they have two models. Um, they have a generator where the generator creates kind of like noisy sentences. And they have a discriminator that tries to discriminate between whether this sentence is, whether each token in the sentence is noisy or not. And so um, basically you mask out the input and you sample things that look uh, reasonable for the output. And importantly here, they have a small mass language model. So it's one that's not like particularly good um, so that the discriminator should be able to get better than it. Um, so this uh, this did better than, um, or this did similarly or better than BERT in, uh, in a lot of tasks. And it's quite a bit faster to train. Um, and uh, they also uh, they also trained on some more data because it was more efficient to train, and uh, as a result, that gave uh, some better results. Um, the intuition behind this is not immediately obvious, but does anyone have a guess about why this might be more efficient to train? Uh, Electra might be more efficient to train than BERT, for example. Any? Yeah. Um, so it works twenty fifteen percent because. Okay, yes, exactly the right answer, but I'll repeat it. So um, in BERT, only 15% of the words are masked. So only 15% of the, the words participate in any prediction task. Um, however, for Electra, every single word here is participating in the prediction task. Um, and so because of this, you're essentially getting a loss from every word. Um, you're getting a loss from every word in the input. So that means that you need to see like eight times fewer sentences to get the same number of like loss calculations, essentially. Yeah. So here in this, in this example, only one is classified as weak, right? So the loss is 50%. If there are two to work. So this is a binary classification problem, but you're solving the, you're getting a loss for the binary classification problem across all of the, um, all of the inputs here. Um, it is uh, relatively label imbalanced because you're masking out like, I forget the exact percentage. I think it might be 15, but it might be something else. You're masking out only a, a small number of the inputs. And so most of them will not be replaced. Most of them will be original, but still you're getting a loss from all of the outputs here. Um, uh, one, two, yeah, and then three, yeah. Right, so I wanted to ask, is this 
this looks similar to a GAD architecture, so it's trained in a similar way. So. Yeah, this is inspired by, uh, again, our ge generative adversarial network architecture. And yeah, this, this generator and discriminator is the so same. Which part of it is similar to the BERT architecture? Because it's mentioned that it's the same as BERT. Well, so they're both uh, transformer models. So that's what I meant by the model architecture. It's the same. Um, uh, yeah, actually, um, I, I've updated my slides this year, and I actually removed the previous like LSTM-based ones. So all, the funny thing is almost all of them use very similar architectures with some minor details. Um, all of these, I believe, are exactly the same as BERT. Um, maybe their activation function is different or something like that, but I, I think all of them are basically the same. Um, yeah, and so you, you have one small transformer here and one uh, larger transformer here. Okay. Um, Sorry, you had what? Yeah, one, two, three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a quick question about the uh, CLN token for Roberta and Electra. Do they still go into the input? And if so, if they're not doing next sentence predictions, what are they doing? Um, for Roberta, you, you uh, said? For either Roberta or Electra, do you put in a CLN token in the input or no? Yeah, so for these these ones, you could put a CLS token in the input, but it, I don't think it's privileged in any way. It's just like another token there. Um, you might still want to add it if you want to use it to do prediction, but um, yeah. Um, I had a, a couple questions from Zoom. Um, one question from Zoom was, can't we do the same thing with BERT if we wanted um, having a loss for the non-masked words? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. We could have... Um, we could calculate a loss over all of the words, um, not just the, the masked words. But the problem is we want to keep most of the words the same because otherwise the sentence will be, just become like incomprehensible. And if we had a loss for all of the words that we kept the same, then like basically the model would learn to just copy things from input to the output, which is kind of too easy. Um, so uh, yeah, so ba basically I, I think these, percentages are relatively finely tuned towards being good for representation learning. Um, and you need something clever like Electra to get around that. Um, another question I had is, is the sampling here something that you can back prop through? Um, so here the generator is fixed and we're only training the discriminator, I believe. So we don't do any back prop through the sampling. Uh, we, we aren't training the generator. Um, and then I had one more question. Yeah. So very, very good question. Doesn't this depend on the mass language model a lot? Um, yes, it, it does depend on the mass language model. Um, the interesting thing is there. I won't, I won't go into all the mathematical details, but there's a concept called noise contrastive estimation. And noise contrastive estimation is basically a way to predict uh, language model probabilities. Um, and it's what you do is you generate some noise over the original distribution and then try to discriminate whether it's, uh, it's true or not. Um, it doesn't matter how good your noise is or how bad your noise is you can still like estimate a language model appropriately. So if we view it from that point of view, you, you can train a model, you can train this model to be a good language model regardless of how good your noise is or not. However, the amount of time it takes to train or uh, like the variance in the training, uh, the noise generating distribution does matter a lot. So from that point of view, um, having like a good, a good but not too good model is like rather important for making it happen. So, um, cool. So I'll move on to the next one. Um, the next one is uh, called XLNet. So um, this is a rather uh, rather popular model. It was created by people here at CMU and Google, and um, the model uh, is similar to BERT, but with one uh, very important difference or actually two, two rather important differences. The first rather important difference um, is that, so the first rather important difference, actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the, um, 
the transformer XL um, equation on the uh, on the slide, but I'll, I'll try to explain it very briefly over here. Um, but there's a there's a method called transformer XL, which we're going to cover, I think, near the end of the class in the long in the long sequence modeling uh, class. But very, very briefly, what it's doing is it's basically learning a, um, a transformer model that does self-attention, not over like the representations in the current sequence of tokens, but also in the representations in the previous sequence of tokens. Um, but it's doing something like truncated backpropagation through time, which uh, you might remember from the RNN class. And it, to give you a refresher on truncated backpropagation through time, basically what that does is it freezes, um, it freezes the representation. It doesn't do backprop into the representation uh, from like the previous sentence, but it um, it uses it in calculating the representations for like the current sequence or current sentence. And transformer XL does something similar. It basically attends to previous sequences, which gives it longer longer context. And um, as I said, I'll be giving doing more detail on that. But um, uh, that's one of the details uh, in XLNet. XLNet can basically attend to longer context. Another detail in XLNet is actually um, they're using an autoregressive language modeling uh, paradigm. So they're calculating words sequence by sequence. But instead of calculating them always from left to right, they calculate them in a random order. So they randomly permute the order of the inputs. And the, the motivation for this is that allows you to learn models that can essentially calculate bi-directional context and not just unidirectional context. So um, it's, it's rather, rather complicated. Um, uh, like they added two, two major like modeling innovations here. Um, but the, the modeling innovations basically um, improved the results and it had state of the art over Robert, uh, uh, Bert, all the other things at the time. Um, one complaint that the authors got was they actually trained on uh, like much more data than uh, like Bert and Roberta. So it wasn't really a fair comparison, um, but they actually went back and did kind of like a blog post where they said, this is XLNet with all the extra data, without all the extra data, and then Bert and Roberta. And they showed that basically the modeling innovations that they did were about half of the gain that they were getting on some Data, like most of the gain they were getting on some data sets, no gain on other data sets. And then the data was like the rest. So it was kind of a combination of both. Yeah. Uh, what's happening in the diagram? Yeah. Um, so basically what, what they're, the diagram is maybe more, uh, more complicated uh, than you need to understand the method. But basically what they're doing is um, normally in an, uh, let's say my dog is cute, is cute. He likes pl uh, playing. And let's say we have a, a standard um, like autoregressive language model. Normally we predict in this order. Uh, let, let's say this is your context and then this is the thing you're predicting. Normally we'd, we would predict he likes playing. Basically what XLNet does is it picks a random order every time. And it might predict like the second word first and then the first word second and then the last word third or something like that. So um, the reason why it does this is this allows you to like calculate uh, representations in, in any order instead of solely left to right. Um, what this is showing in the diagram here is it's showing like the mask that you would need to do that, the transformer mask that you would need to do that. But basically what they're doing is, is this. Yeah. So is it like shuffling the word? Yes. It's shuffling the words, but it's not shuffling the positional embeddings. So you know, you know the it's shuffling the prediction order of the words, but it's not shuffling the positional embeddings. So you still know the order, original order of the words when you make the predictions. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now this is probably what I would suggest is maybe the default uh, model you should be using in, in 2022 if you want to do mass language model-based pre-training and fine-tuning. Um, it's DBERTA. It's basically a, um, a transformer model, and it has something that they call disentangled attention. And um, this is a modeling 
innovation that they gave where basically they they added uh, relative positional embeddings, which tell you how much you should be um, how much you should be paying attention to something based on the relative position um, uh, with correspondence to each other. And then they also have content. Um, but unlike normal attention, which like concatenates all of them together and considers them like uh, considers them like together, uh, it disentangles them, hence the name Deberta, and uh, and treats them separately. Um, and then uh, another thing is absolute positional embeddings are added near the end of the model, um, and this is basically to prevent the model from like overfitting too much on using the positional embeddings. So I'm not going to go into the details because it's not super important, but basically there's a few model in innovations. Um, they uh, also have mass language modeling. They add regularization by perturbing the input embeddings to basically make it harder uh, harder to do the prediction. Um, and then, as is the common uh, as is the common story, they trained on more data and a bigger model, and it works better. So uh, th they do demonstrate that there, there's some gain, not just due to that, but also due to the modeling in, uh, innovations. But you know, more data, a bigger model is generally a good idea. Um, the reason why I recommend this is it seems to easily be state of the art uh, on a lot of the kind of language understanding tasks. Um, it's also good for um, kind of like out of the box use of the embeddings for anything that you want to be using them for. So um, by default, if you want to like download a model and use it, uh, this would be a pretty good one to start out with. Um, then another thing to talk about um, that's important practically is compact uh, pre-trained models. So we don't, um, you know, we don't want to be using extremely large models all the time. Uh, large models are expensive. Can we make them smaller? Um, two famous examples of these are Albert. Uh, these use uh, smaller embeddings um, and they use parameter sharing across all layers. Um, this was very surprising to me that this worked at all. Um, because basically what they're saying is the transformer model has the same embeddings across all of the layers. Um, but the results uh, were reasonably impressive, at least at the time. And this makes your model much more compact. Um, another approach to making compact models is something called Distilbert, um, which uses an idea called distillation, where essentially you train a model not to predict the actual um, outputs, but to predict the distribution predicted by a larger model like BERT. So um, the reason why this is good is actually um, like my dog is cute. Like let's say we mask this out and tried to predict a dog here. Um, that gives you some information. You can predict you can predict dog, but it might be even better to predict like dog uh, seven percent, cat uh, six percent, uh, sun. 4%. Um, and BERT will actually output a distribution like this. So it's telling you the whole distribution, not just the sample from the distribution that you happen to get for this particular sentence. And so uh, by training a smaller model to mimic BERT, that allows you to train faster and, uh, and more robustly. OK, um, cool. So uh, to try to make it through all the content we're going to be talking about today, I'll uh, move on to autoregressive language models. Um, so autoregressive language models are um, the other paradigm that I talked about where we're not uh, training a mass language model, but training from left to right. Um, these used to not be a major player in the area of uh, pre-training, but now they, they are kind of like the major player in the area of pre-training. Um, and uh, kind of one of the first major models that really made this popular was uh, GPT-2. Um, at the time, it was a big model. It's 1.5 billion parameters. Um, the training objective is just standard language modeling. And the data that was used to train it was web text on millions of web pages. Um, the reason why people got excited about this was its impressive results in the generation of long form text. And um, also, they did zero shot task completion, or what we call prompting uh, nowadays. Uh, where they basically gave it uh, a question and uh, and they asked it um, asked it to fill in the you know the response and they demonstrated that you could get non-trivial accuracy by doing this. Um, at the time, it was not available open source. Now it's available open source. You can easily download it, use it, uh, etc. 
um, the next kind of major, uh, like, I guess, big result in the area is uh, GPT-3. And GPT-3, again, is a left to right transformer. It has 175 uh, billion parameters trained using uh, standard language modeling. It was trained on the common crawl, uh, one uh, ter tera word, uh, so one trillion words. Um, it has further impressive results in generation of long form text, zero shot task completion. Um, now to access it, the way you access it is through an API. So you need to, uh, you need to pay to use an API. Um, another thing I should mention is GPT-3 uh, has different varieties. There's like different sizes. There's also version one and version two. Um, I don't actually know what the difference between version one and version two is, but version two is a lot better than what they reported in their paper. Uh, I suspect that they have probably uh, just been training on, um, on more data for longer. They've also been training on, I imagine, curated data. Another thing is if you look at the API terms, anything you upload to open AP, uh, OpenAI, they can use. So if you've been uploading a whole bunch of prompts and answers and stuff, they're probably taking that and training the model on your data too. So um, if you're a company and don't want to give open API access to uh, uh, open AI access to your training data, you might not want to upload it through their API. Um, Another uh, big result recently was uh, was something called Palm, uh, which was uh, trained by Google. This is another left to right transformer. Um, there is actually some modeling innovations here, like they have different relative positional encodings. They're using a different activation function and other stuff like this. Um, I think they were more open in uh, in their model architecture than OpenAI tra traditionally is, uh, kind of paradoxically given the name, um, <laughs> but. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it's more or less a transformer with some some tweaks. Um, also trained on common crawl, uh, one trillion words. And uh, again, the results are impressive uh, with generation of long form text, zero shot task completion, et cetera. Um, all of these are in the references. I Actually, sorry, Palm might not be in the references, but I, I think a lot of these are in the references. Another thing is uh, OPT and Bloom. These are kind of like two parallel efforts by Meta and um, uh, and Hugging Face or uh, Hugging the Hugging Face Big Science Workshop. Um, these are entirely these are mostly open uh, language models. Uh, so they you can download the parameters. They have sizes up to 175 gigabytes. Um, OPT. OPT, you need to apply to get access to the largest model, um, and you can't use it for commercial purposes. Uh, Bloom, I think anybody can get access to any of the models. Um, one interesting thing about OPT is they have this extremely long experimental log uh, that tells you about uh, all the problems that they had while training this gigantic model. Um, it's very informative, and it will make you feel much better when all of your experiments are dying due to out-of-memory errors, because you see it happens to uh, professional engineers at Meta as well. So, um, and like arbitrary changes of the learning rate to make their model work. You know, uh, we're they're they're not magicians any more than we are, basically. So, uh, <laughs> so do you have any uh, do you have any questions about uh, these things here? I'm also going to talk more about this in the prompting lecture that we have uh, coming up pretty soon. So um, other than that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lucio to do some uh, final final talks. Cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, how do I use this What to like go up and down? Uh, you can slide. just use the mouse, and you'll, you'll oh, have okay. to look either at that screen or that screen. OK, great. All right, cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lucio. I'm one of Graham's students, and I'll be talking about some of my work related to just like pre-training. Uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, and uh, feedback is welcome after this if you want to like send me an email and tell me how well I did. Cool. All right. Um, so basically, we've already been talking about pre-training and the impact of uh, learning. Uh, from performing transfer learning. Uh, there is the obvious like improvement in downstream performance. So if you take a task that you don't have enough
Excuse me, Lucio, but I think you're muted. Did anybody catch any of the, I guess now, where did, where did you stop hearing what I was saying? Well, uh, I, I think, oh, uh, no sounds. Okay. Uh, no, I, I think you, I think you should have sound now. I just unmuted. Okay. Can, um, can everybody hear on, on Zoom? Since the beginning, almost. Okay. okay. Do you have any questions on the stuff I... <laughs> Okay. This is this is the amazing first teaching experience, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, um, so so why don't um I, I think I think it's mostly been according to the slide. So why don't we go through to the end and yeah, then um, okay. and then but we can if anybody on Zoom has questions, text your question uh, about the slides I've done so far in the Zoom chat and I will try to answer them. Why don't since we're a little bit short on time, why don't we just continue? Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, so the other thing too is uh, no free lunch, right? A lot of different you might want to evaluate or use your pre-trained model on. Uh, these models are usually evaluated against specific benchmarks like glue, super glue. And whilst those have a number of tasks, it doesn't guarantee that your particular end task is served, right? Because you have a very wide distribution in terms of like possible downstream tasks that these models can be used on. Um, sorry. Um, uh, okay, cool. And then the other thing too is that there is no clear way to cross validate uh, your pre trained model, right? You have this kind of disjoint process where you are optimizing one pre trained objective, uh, but the main goal of pre training is for you to do well on some downstream, downstream tasks. But a priori, you don't know what downstream tasks you are going to do well in. So, how exactly do you cross validate your model? There is no uh, kind of like clear, direct way to actually perform cross validation on your model when you're doing pre training. Um, so, Basically, given these uh, disadvantages, uh, the idea is basically to kind of shift the goalposts to uh, to kind of performing pre-training that is informed by the end tasks that you care about. But before we do this, uh, we basically try to understand some of the design choices that go into people making pre-training objectives, right? Um, and so if you look at it, you can basically decompose some of your existing pre-training objectives into kind of these rough columns which is what choice of data that they use, uh, what choice of input transformation they perform on the inputs before they basically try to denoise or uh, make a prediction on the inputs, the type of representation they perform, for example, BERTS does bidirectional uh, representation, Elmo does uh, left to right and then right to left and then concatenates, and then um, ExcelNet does this kind of random factorized order that we just discussed. And then in terms of the output token, you basically have, you can predict your denoise, you can predict uh, like a denoise version of the token, or you can do something like GPT that basically tries to predict the next token. So we have all these different design decisions that go into making a pre-training objective. And we don't know how exactly these design decisions affect each of the downstream tasks that we care about, right? So the idea is to, um, instead of, uh, again, just to keep things in context, we have pre-training objectives. The pre-training objectives don't, get information about the downstream tasks we want to solve. But we also know that we make a lot of design decisions during pre-training that actually help the downstream task. So how can we connect the two of them? And the idea is to basically uh, let the, the end task itself choose which design decisions it thinks it's important. So here we are moving the goalpost from having one single model that is trained on all this data and trained on all these, like this single objective, but, uh, and then wanting to um, fine tune each individual task on this particular like single pre-trained model to this idea that we can set up a bunch of different pre-training objectives um, using a construction and then let the end task itself choose which of these different these choices at once. So uh, given the search space that we've defined, which is basically decomposing all these pre-training design choices, we can actually just simply take the cross product of these design choices, uh, which is uh, these design stages here, uh, data transform representation output, and uh, taking the cross product basically gives us reconstructs uh, existing objectives that we are already familiar with, uh, like GPT, uh, BERT, TAPT, ETC, but also in the space of this cross product is new objectives that we previously not investigated. And the idea is that some of these new objectives that are constructed from previously ignored combinations of uh, pre-training design choices might actually be might actually end up being useful to specific end tasks if we give those end tasks the opportunity to choose which pre-training design choices they want. Does that make sense? Any questions? Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, we also basically you remember with the um, the Electra paper where basically we we used a model to generate uh, some of the tokens in place, and then we use another model to discriminate which of those were generated tokens by a model or which of those were real tokens. So that's real and synth. Uh, denoising token is slightly different. Yes. Yeah. It's the more the birds denoising token. Um, what's between classic transfer setup and pre-trained and fine-tuned? So um, this is a question from the Zoom. So the transfer learning can capture a wide range of things. I like to think of pre-trained and fine-tuned as one example of transfer learning, right? Where you are making the sequential, you are, learning, you are breaking your learning process into a sequence. You pre-train and then you fine-tune. Uh, there are other ways in which you can transfer information between tasks, which is actually to just multitask them directly. And the idea is that, and we'll see this basically soon, which is if you multitask them directly, instead of doing the sequential process, you allow your task to actually choose which elements of the other tasks in the multitask setup are useful for it. Does that make sense? So in pre-trained and fine-tuned, you pre-trained, fine-tuned, it's a sequential process, one precedes the other. At the end, you can't have the second step informing the first step directly. But if you multitask, which is to make those two steps in parallel, instead of making them sequential, then you can have that the end task actually informs what decisions to make in the pre-trading process. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Um, so we've, uh, again, oh, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. So th that's what is classically done, right? People pre-train on a supervised task and then fine tune on a supervised task. What some of my work is saying is that um, if you have, let's say, tasks that are on the more tail end of the distribution that don't behave in the way regular tasks behave, and this is a very amorphous concept, you might want to think about doing something else, which is basically combining them to be a multitask learning problem, where your, your end task itself selects what unsupervised objectives to use. Does that make sense? So it's like, um, just to drive home the points, no, so do this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just to drive home the points, you have this setup where you pre-train and then you fine-tune. Technically, there is a big barrier between these two steps, right? And basically, what I've been thinking about a lot is how can we basically change the process to this, where uh this basically is your end task and this is your pre-training objective but then basically they are coupled together such that the end task itself has power to choose what aspects of these pre-training objective it wants right and again this would be more important for let's say end tasks that are more outside of the distribution that you basically uh, usually see in your pre-training data cool. all right um, how am i doing on time yeah so that's a problem, right? Like yeah. one of the main advantages of pre-training is to obtain like these um, representations which are good. Yes. And like they can require or leverage a lot of data. Yeah. Now if you're adding an end task along with the pre-training objective, yeah. you'd have to use a ton of data with your task specific data. And like especially like that means for the practitioner, mm -hmm. the amount of compute required to obtain good representations blows up. So it yeah, that's a great question. So the question was basically you are going from this to this. Right. And again, we talked about the benefits of pre-training being amortized compute where this can be done by a big company and then this can be done by you. Right. So there's multiple things. Uh, one is there's a paradigm called continued pre-training where people do this and then do this again and then fine tune. So one of the things you can do is to take a model that has already been pre-trained. But I'm saying instead of doing continued pre-training, which is multiple steps of this, if you do the first big one that a company does you, Instead of doing another pre-training and forming a chain of pre-training, you can rather do this. So that's one, one thing. The other thing too is that if you're a company that has, let's say, if the compute and you think that your problem is important enough, right, such that you have to do this, then if you're, if for example, your problem is like deciding who gets a lever, that's a generic, but it's a very high stakes problem, then Maximizing your performance is, is like, you know, more intense than basically compute burden. And so all of these paradigms gives you better performance is what you would go for. So again, it depends on the setting. But that is, this is an example of the case where an everyday person can still use this as opposed to the continued pre-training paradigm.
Yeah, sure. So is it like a, uh, has this been explored where you can like say given the task uh, mm -hmm. description or something Yeah. and let the model or uh, let a model figure out which of the pre-training tasks can be selected for doing it? Yes. So that's basically kind of what we are coming to. Huh. It kind of, yeah. Um. So uh this is so i i won't go into the details of the method but the idea basically is that you can define all these different pre-training objectives by taking the cross product of all these different design decisions and then you can develop an algorithm that basically says uh given this entire that i have in mind can you choose for me which of these pre-training objectives is most beneficial um and you can do that dynamically over this over the training uh, sequence um yeah so there is, if you want, I can give you the reference to the paper. Um, I think we might be out of time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just like a, a little bit about yeah. like why, uh, how you do that, you know, like it, it's basically based on like the alignment of the gradients between the tasks that you're doing. Um, again, we won't go into the details. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah. If you want to just, uh, we can talk about it. There's some, just basically alignment of the gradients. Yes. Are, are um, we in time? I, we oh, have okay. a few more minutes. Yeah. I think it's probably worth going through the last three slides. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, so let's see. So this is, so basically this part, we're talking more about the practicals of training, uh, large of using large pre-trained models. How do you get these models? Um, you can go on uh, Hugging Face. There's a lot of these models available. You can just download them. It's simple as like just clicking on something and, and you have the API, Python API too if you don't just want to download the weights directly. Um, in terms of uh, practically uh, getting things to work uh, or like I just advise for running things in a compute constraint setting, you can always use a smaller version of these pre-trained models, like the still birds, tiny birds. There's so many variations. So you can look for a smaller version of it that fits kind of like your compute budget. The other thing too is like, how do you handle issues with like memory and how much, like if you're training on large batch sizes, uh, the trick is to not use a single large batch size the trick is to use multiple small batch sizes that you aggregate together. So instead of basically doing the, if you are familiar with PyTorch, you do backward and then dot step, rather you do backward once, backward twice, backward three times for however many different batches that can fit into memory. And then before you do a final dot step with your optimizer. And then the other thing too is the question of fine tuning. Like what layers do you fine tune? Do you fine tune all the layers? If you fine tune all the layers, then it's more computationally intensive. But if you sub-select which layers to fine tune, then you basically uh, have a lower compute burden. And usually the rule of thumb is to, first of all, try to fine tune the top layers and then maybe the, uh, the layer norm layers before you try to fine tune everything together. Um, and this part is the part about scaling laws. Um, basically, everybody's trying to make these models bigger. Um, the question is, why do are people excited about making the models bigger? And it's because of performance profiles like this. You basically have that the bigger models, which are basically the, the lighter shade of yellow here, uh, have better performance in terms of like test loss. This is some perplexity. Um, and then you notice that basically these, uh, um, first of all, they train faster because for the same, number of tokens processed if you draw a vertical line here you realize that the uh, the yellow lines achieve a, a lower loss for the same number of tokens uh, than the kind of like the smaller models um and back to the question of the question that somebody asks about like why would you want to train for longer um there's training for longer in this setting usually means that you're introducing the model to new tokens so new tokens that it hasn't seen before so the question becomes uh, one of the classical questions in, in scaling laws is like, should I make the model bigger and keep keep the same number of tokens? Because you can roughly think of compute as the size of the model, which is the number of parameters or flops times the number of tokens it processes, right? So you can either scale things by making the model bigger and keeping the number of tokens fixed, or I can make the keep the size of the model small and increase the number of tokens, which means that I have to run for longer. And there is an optimal kind of like trade-off between them. Um, and several papers like the Chinchilla paper we mentioned say that like a lot of people have been increasing the size, uh, but actually what you want to do in some situations is to actually increase the number of uh, training steps and keep the size small. Um, and you get better performance by doing that. So larger isn't necessarily better. Yeah. All right, cool. In Thank one, you. And one of the one of the interesting things from this paper is it, it's like if you have this much compute, you can kind of predict, you can kind of predict what size of model would be the best for you at that at that amount of compute. It's like rather predictable as you like increase the size. Um, cool. cool. Yeah, I think we are, sorry, uh, a few minutes over, apologies, right. but um, uh, we'd be happy to take questions up here. So thank you.